Federal government confirms second case of coronavirus. Emir of Kano, Mohamed Sanusi II, has been dethroned. In international news, Italy locks down 16 million of its citizens as coronavirus cases surge. And later, Guinea's Horoya knocks Aimba out of Confederation Cup. This is ANN News. I am Olajumokio Latinji. The federal government has confirmed a new carrier of the COVID-19 virus, making it the country's second confirmed case. Minister of Health Dr. Sage Hanere says the new patient is one of those in contact with the Italian man who was first infected and is quarantined in Lagos. Hanere announced this at a press conference in Benin City, Edo State Capital. He said one of the important response strategies at the containment stage has been to identify all those who had contact with the Italian man, ensure their street isolation, and to check daily for any symptoms. The minister said going by other countries' experiences and evidence from newly published studies on non-symptomatic infections, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control advised that samples should be taken from all contacts of the index case for testing. Emir Okano Malans Mohamedou Sanusi II has been dethroned after the approval by Kano State Executive Council at a special sitting on Monday. Before the dethronement on Monday, there was crisis in the Kano State House of Assembly over the report of the chairman of Kano State Public Complaints and Anti-Corruption Commission. Secretary to the state government, Alhaji Usman Alhaji, says relevant stakeholders agreed with the removal because the MS action violated a provision of Kano State law and alleged disrespect for the office of the governor and other government agencies. Governor Umar Ganduje has been at loggerheads with Emir Sanusi for some time, and many see this development as a continuation of the initial crisis that led to the creation of additional four new Emirates in the state. This is not the first time the Emir and the Kano Emirates are coming under probe since Mala Mohammed Sanusi II ascended the throne six years ago. This man says a new Emir would be announced soon. It is certain the last has not been heard of this situation. An amendment bill that would make vice presidents, governors, and their deputies lose their immunity if they misappropriate public funds has been introduced by the Senate. The upper chamber says the bill will make it possible for law enforcement agencies to arrest and prosecute any vice president, governors, or their deputies found guilty of any corrupt practices. The bill was sponsored by Chairman of the Senate Committee on the review of the 1999 Constitution, who also doubles as the Deputy President of the Senate, Ovie Omar Gege. Presently, the President of Nigeria, Vice President, Governors and their deputies are protected by the nation's law from criminal prosecution while in office. The proposed legislation from the Senate seeks to change that, but it excludes the President. Oil marketers under the umbrella of the Major Oil Marketers Association of Nigeria are demanding for a lower dollar rate of 306 Naira, which they say would enable them to resume importation of premium motor spirits, also known as petrol. The marketers also said there was an urgent need for the federal government through the Petroleum Product Pricing Regulatory Agency to increase the margins on petrol to encourage them to make more investment. Chairman of the association, Adetunji Oyetunji, says the group is asking for an immediate margin increase or removal of subsidy because the London cost of petrol presently is much lower than the approved pump price. Oyetunji also lamented that the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation has been the sole importer of petrol for more than two years after private oil marketers stopped importing the commodity because of crude price fluctuations, among other issues. A political science scholar, Professor Michael Oni, says it would be difficult for Nigeria to have an electoral offenses tribunal that would ensure a free, fair, and credible election in the country. 
company says this is because all past civilian presidents and vice presidents are beneficiaries of all manners of electoral violence and manipulations. The professor listed the administrations of Shou Shagari, Olusha Gwabasajo, Omar Yaradua, Goodluck Jonathan, and Muhammad Buhari as direct profiteers from electoral violence and manipulations in the country. The professor of research methodology said this during Babcock University's 31st inaugural lecture in Elysian, Ogun State. Onisa has also calls for legislation of six years single term for every federal or state political office order in the country and a two-party system which he says will help mitigate ethnicity and religious polarities in Nigeria politics. He explained that the adoption of a six-year single term would help in minimizing re-election acrimonies and hasten power rotation among different ethnic groups. Such as the Registration Council of Nigeria, CRC HAN, has begun a nationwide screening of public and private primary and secondary school teachers. The council says this was important to help expose unqualified and unregistered persons from the system. The Registrar and Chief Executive of the Council, Professor Josiah Ajiboye, said the exercise will start in 33 states and the Federal Capital Territory. The process excludes Adamawa, Yobe and Bornu states because of security challenges in those areas. Coming up, African stories. Locust invasion threatens livelihoods of Kenyan pastoralists. And later, international news. Italy locks down 16 million citizens over soaring COVID-19 cases. You are watching ANN. Welcome back. This is ANN News, not African News. Billions of locusts have devoured so much of the farms and foods humans were meant to eat in East Africa. The threat of food insecurity is now great, and this humongous locust invasion is ferociously depleting the livelihoods of pastoralists in Turkana County, Kenya. In Kenya's arid Turkana region, pastoralism is a way of life and a major source of income. But pastoralists like a poor Lorot now watch in frustration as locust swarms compete with his livestock of a grazeland. <laughs> I had 80 goats and sheep, but at the moment I am now remaining with only 50. After the locusts arrived, I have lost 30 goats. This is because after the locusts arrived, they ate a lot of our animal feeds. If the locusts land on the vegetation, they are clearing everything, leaving nothing for our goats. This locust condition is also affecting us as pastoralists. Like now, our livestock feed has gone down. We will have no goats and no money soon. Our children cannot grow well when we don't have food to feed them if our goats die. The Food and Agriculture Organization warns that if not kept in check, locust numbers will increase with every breeding cycle. The conditions are now conducive for, for the survival of the eggs and hatching. So the climate is now very ideal for them to multiply. And the, the threat is real and a big one if nothing is done. You see, this is the right stage of control and uh, any action at uh, this time would be more appropriate rather than postponing uh, intervention at a later date. Surveillance is a crucial component to control the desert locust invasion, but that alone is not enough. The Kenyan government has allocated pesticide spraying pumps, but it's been a challenge to satisfy demand. We have had one aerial air aircraft sent to Turkana, but it has been here for uh, only four days and it ran short of uh, fuel. It ran short of um, uh, the chemical and uh, even it's going for service. All seven sub-counties of Turkana have been invaded by locusts and many are still waiting for assistance which might not come in the short term. Uganda Health Minister Jane Ruth Asang says 22 foreigners who arrived from high-risk COVID-19 countries then refused to self-quarantine but were sent back to their home countries. The 22 travelers arrived from Category 1 countries deemed high risk in the ongoing coronavirus outbreak. They are in the country for a two-day business forum hosted by Uganda and attended by delegates from Europe. 
Officials at Entebbe International Airport said the visitors were informed of the self-quarantine requirements, but they refused to observe the rule. They opted to return to their home countries. Uganda has no confirmed or suspected COVID-19 case. The ministry has categorized Italy, Iran, South Korea, France, China, Germany and Spain as countries whose citizens must self-quarantine for 14 days even if they do not have coronavirus symptoms. Japan has been experiencing serious coronavirus cases. They have called into question the viability of rescheduling the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Many countries have voiced support for postponing the Games. The South African athletes say they see no problem with holding the Olympics as scheduled. Reporter Sayers Du Plenis has the story. Following the IOC president's announcement, many athletes would have breathed a sigh of relief that their Olympic preparations would remain on track for the sporting showpiece in July. And although the virus remains a serious threat, the South African Sports Confederation and Olympic Committee will forge ahead with their plans while monitoring the situation. We at SASCOC act in a professional and um, um, responsible manner. We rely on the World Health Organization's um, and bulletins as well as the IPC and the IOC's bulletins. Those organizations at international level will guide us and we will follow their guidelines. I personally think we should go full force but with open eyes and really just make sure that, that we don't become um, blindsided by the, the event. We have to take precautions so I seriously don't think it's a panic at this moment in time but we definitely have to be very closely monitoring the situation, making use of the information that the WH um, gladly gives us and, and disposes us and we have to make sure that we keep with those rules and then I'm sure we'll be safe. Saskok has called for all athletes to follow the same precautions they normally would when traveling but urged them to continue putting in the hard work in the build-up to the event in Tokyo. And that is exactly what the 2016 Olympians Clarence Munyai and Wenda Null intend to do until things drastically change. I want to say they say it's disrupting, but we do think about it and we talk about it with my coach because the best thing we can do right now because we can train and wait until they give a final call if the Olympics can happen or not. Because if we stop now and then they find a cure, then it's just going to mess up the whole process because you stop training and then you're not going to be ready. For me, I'm just focusing on what I'm doing from day to day, um, enjoying my journey. I don't want to put too much focus on what the coronavirus will affect um, around the Olympic Games. So for now, unless they state otherwise, in my mind it still goes on as planned, so that's how my planning will go. Athletes face a number of challenges on and off the track. Stress around travel, injuries and the pressure to perform at a global showpiece like the Olympics takes its toll. So the last thing they need is to worry about a virus like COVID-19. For now though, although the coronavirus is a serious threat to their health, it remains business as usual with all their focus on doing their country proud at the Games in Tokyo. When we return, international news. Italy locked down 16 million citizens over soaring COVID-19 cases. And later, sport. Boroya knocks Aimba out of Confederation Cup. You are watching ANN. Welcome back. This is ANN News on the international front. First, our hearts go out to the people of Italy for the devastating coronavirus outbreak there. Milan is the epicenter for the country and actually for all of Europe as nearly 8,000 COVID-19 cases and more than 360 deaths have been recorded in the country. 16 million persons in this bustling Italian commercial center and 14 regions in the north have been thrown into a lockdown. To put this in perspective, that is like grounding nearly half of the population of Poland. Italian Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte had no choice but to take drastic measures to stem the surging rate of the virus that had increased by nearly 1,500 in 24 hours. As it stands, Italy's confirmed cases have suppressed South Africa, South Korea, pardon me, and are only second to China, where the whole outbreak began. The lockdown decree was signed on Sunday morning, banning the movement of people in and out of the body. Italy's wealthiest and most populous region, has Milan, as its main city.
Conte said the country was facing a national emergency and his action was aimed at containing the spread of the contagion to avoid overstretching the hospitals. The lockdown will go on until April the 3rd and would be enforced by the police and army. With this sweeping shutdown of Italy's industrial north, the country can write off any hope for economic growth this year. It was already on the way to economic recession before the COVID-19 outbreak last month. The country's gross domestic product had fallen 0.3% in the last quarter of last year. The U.S. has been very cautious and determined to stem the rise in coronavirus cases in many parts of the country. And thousands of passengers on a cruise ship, the Wagyu Princess, was stuck on board for an extra day, so two crew members the were suspected of being infected could be tested. They were negative. So the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, cleared the ship on Sunday evening. It has since docked at Port Everglades in southern Florida. And while the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has advised Americans to avoid taking cruises for now, it has also advised older persons and others at elevated risk from COVID-19 to avoid crowded places and non-essential travel, including long plane rides. And I think the advice will work for anyone, not just Americans. While coronavirus stories from Italy, the U.S. and some other hotspots around the world has been devastating, but the COVID-19 news from China, where it all started, has been cherry. China has closed most of the makeshift hospitals it opened to receive coronavirus patients in the epidemic's epicenter because the number of new infections in the country has hit a record low. Reporter Chu Mengu has the story. Finally, departing and saying farewell to the temporary hospital. On Sunday, at least two makeshift medical facilities in Wuhan have cleared their patients, either by transferring them to designated hospitals which now have more beds than patients, or by discharging them. This gymnasium-turned-medical center is one of them. Among the 1,011 COVID-19 patients it has received since February the 11th, 727 have been discharged, as most came in with mild symptoms. With the last batch of patients gone, peace will soon return to this gymnasium. But both the nurses and patients here tell me the collective fight they've put on over the last month is something they would remember for the rest of their life. I have an agreement with the medical staff. I'll go meet them if I visit their city. And if they come to Wuhan again, I'll take them to try our local delicacies. After we became familiar with each other, it's hard to say goodbye. For some, however, the feelings are more complicated. My wife and child are still under quarantine. My mom passed away too. Medical workers in the temporary hospital come from China's Tianjin city and Hebei province. With the facility now closed, they await their transfer orders. Quite exciting, this feeling. Hard to forget, hard to describe. Despite having worked for almost a month now, the nurses say they're ready to continue their fight whenever and wherever they're needed next. Well, it was International Women's Day on Sunday and festivities went on around the world in celebration. The main thing, they reverberated from the streets of Manila to the allies in Turkey and even the conflicts laid in northwest regions of Cameroon was the call to end exploitation and increase equality. That call was not lost on marches in Santiago, Chile. And that is where we find reporter Joel Richards. In searing heat, women chant the anti-rape anthem, a rapist in your path, as they march through Santiago. This song has gone viral since the Chilean collective first performed it last November. Organizers say International Women's Day in Chile brought over two million women to the streets in the capital. We women have always been strong. The thing is that men have not wanted to recognize this. But today the march is for all of us, so we are heard once and for all. This is wonderful. I grew up in a time when bad treatment of women was justified and was normal. But our daughters and granddaughters must not suffer like that. An end to gender violence and economic and social inequality, as well as legalizing abortion, are just some of the demands here, as many organizations marched under the umbrella of the 8th of March feminist coordinator. 
What we have realized is that we need to connect struggles that were divided over the years into a common struggle. We have called this the feminist struggle against the insecurity of life. This march took place in the context of the worst social unrest Chile has seen in decades. Protests began last October over a hike in metro fares. More than two dozen people have been killed, with thousands injured, including hundreds of protesters left with serious eye injuries from rubber pellets fired by police. This social uprising has many aspects. It is in part about education, as well as pensions and health, while underlying all of this is insecurity of life. That is the concept. People do not have a dignified life. This is the first major demonstration this year, the first of a number of marches called for this month as the protests in Chile pick up once again, ahead of what is a historic vote in April, when Chile will decide whether or not to rewrite its constitution. A central demand here, including social and feminist organizations when writing a new Chilean constitution. Up next, sport. Guinea's Poroya knocks Aimba out of Confederation Cup. Please stay with us. You are watching ANN. Welcome back. This is ANN News and Sport. Aimba Football Club have crashed out of the CAF Confederation Cup after falling 2 0 to Guinean side Huroya AC in the quarterfinal second leg in Conakry on Sunday. The Guinean side won the tie 3 1 on aggregate after holding Aimba to a 1 1 draw in Aba nine days ago. Sierra Leone Football Association has denied reports that were considering requesting the CAF postpone the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations qualifying fixture against the Super Eagles. The Leone Stars are shuttered against the Super Eagles in Asaba on Friday, with a reverse fixture to hold four days later in Freetown. That is the end of news this evening. Thank you for joining us. For details on these and other breaking stories, visit our website, nnafrica.news. Conversation continues on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Africa TV. I am Olajumoke Olatunji. Have a pleasant evening.